quick recap on each of the breakout sessions, um, see what was similar, what was different, and each group's gonna have four minutes. We're gonna start with the online group. So Katie or Lorraine, can you share your screen through Zoom? You're on the projector. Um, sure. Lorraine, can you do this? Because I'm not sure how to do it. Oh, wait. There we go. There you okay. are. Great. Thank you so much for doing that. All right. So um, for the question number one, outstanding questions and grand challenges, um, a lot of the, the discussion kept coming back to how do we link between surface and long-term tectonics. It requires extrapolating across scale jumps, both um, spatially and temporally. Um, and there are a lot of questions about the choices of characterization at each time scales and then what scale do we need for the processes. Um, some more specific questions um, that was brought up, I think, by Roman was that, or Roman, sorry if I said your name incorrectly, problems with virtual. Um, that we can show models and spatial patterns and erodibility and that can drive patterns of deformation. But can we find this um, in natural settings? We see it in the models. And then correspondingly, <clears throat> how does that drive difference uh, or what's driving differences in erodibility? Is it climate gradients, rock strength gradients? And how do we evaluate the relative importance of these parameters? And um, this led to another kind of discussion about what's important in each study when we're talking about this. So what's important in climate versus what's important in tectonics versus what's important in erosion. Um, is this kind of like dependency on what's important in helping connect us across the scales or is that actually limiting some of those connections? And then also a big kind of overarching and more philosophical question is, is it, by two different communities asking very different science questions leading to incompatible data sets, which drives into um, the data needs question. And again, we broke out and had more philosophical um, types of um, questions and then more specific needs. So the more philosophical uh, needs of, we need the data at the right time scales, but overall there's a big need for the sensitivity analysis both for numerical models as well as data sets. And I think everybody was incredibly um, excited and encouraged and also um, brought up some thought provoking by Katie's talk. So we were thinking that this like test of sensitivity can help drive data collection choices, whether it's like boots on the ground field work or remote, remote sensing. Um, there's also a struggle that there's different types of data available for the two different types of scales, surface versus deep processes. And there's um, abundant data for surface processes, but much less so for uh, deeper tectonic processes. And so for surface processes, this leads to a data-oriented and physical model-oriented approaches, but the data-oriented approach is more limited for tectonics um, and deeper processes. So more specific needs uh, for data, more information about fault can kinematics um, with age constraints, um, a, a more uh, in-depth catalog of material resistance uh, beyond just lithology and getting into more like clean mineralogy and content and particle arrangement, and moving into impurgation. So on the model side of thing, again, there was a, a large philosophical discussion as well as some specific needs. And um, the more philosophical is are more complicated models more useful? And I think this is um, an important question that, that requires some very careful thinking. Um, theoretical models versus data testing models, I think this is in particular for surface processes. Of we need to keep in mind how and which models can be tested in reality and which ones are truly hypothetical. Um, which models need more lower resolution data over large scales, versus very high resolution data over smaller scales. I think another interesting philosophical question is, is there a benefit to centralized modeling efforts like for um, the climate models or is it distributed modeling um, more efficient than hypothesis testing? So specific needs, uh, adaptive mesh, again, and then testing about, are we actually capturing physical processes correctly? Done.
that same exact thing is probably going to happen again, um, unless someone can show me how to use my iPhone in the next four minutes. Josh and Pedro, can you guys come forward? And then um, Scott and Jessica will be calling you down. Do you have? I don't think no one. Do any of the breakout groups want to project? I think they can just. Okay. like up here, that close. So, on, okay, um, real close, all right, here we go, yeah. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of overlap between what is uh, being said between the groups, but um, I'll just highlight some of the main points. We discussed a lot, but um, there's a need to define a tangible overlap between the two disciplines um, so that we can start to then um, to, to begin to focus on the links that we need the bridge, right? Um, how much, this was just said, how much complexity in the surface models matter for the, deep, uh, the deeper models, um, the geodynamic models and vice versa? Um, th that's another question that popped up and we need, one thing that um, I didn't hear so far was the, that we need to better explore the sedimentary records in the models, because uh, basically that's what we use for uh, g gathering the data. So um, we need to incorporate that more in, in our surface process models in order to um, begin to understand the, what our data means, what our obs observations mean. Um, in all of these, um, oh, and there's, uh, yeah, this was just brought up too. How can we actually test uh, the geodynamic models with uh, observable data that we can go out in the field and collect? Um, and in all of these, there's a, a resolution problem between the two fields and the MOLLE in the two fields, how we uh, reconcile resolution in the surface model process with um, when we're trying to integrate the geodynamics. Um, and also scale, uh, scales, temporal and spatial scales are an issue between the two. And uh, there's a need for an integrated um, model so that we can um, start with the simple task, the simplest way to link the two and then uh, begin advancing in that realm. Do you have anything to add, Josh? Um, I guess since we have a moment, I'll just add that I think the communities are still very much uh, compelled by the potential for coupling. Um, I think there would be a really interesting discussion if we said, give me the ingredients, geological, climate, tectonic setting, what have you, where couplings do and don't tend to occur. Um, and I think you would get a really interesting set of um, uh, outputs from a discussion like that, just in terms of the amount of people that have gone out looking for them and found them in some places and not in others. So a systematic approach is to um, where are these things going to occur and why would be a useful endeavor. Um, another sort of theme that came out is that um, we don't know how much uh, complexity each other's models require. And so we had a little soul searching exercise where we said, what's the biggest thing you don't understand about the other, the other side? If we all sort of put on a surface or a geodynamic hat. And it's interesting, a geodynamicist might say, is it enough to just trim off a landscape at a critical taper um, in terms of representing erosion? And for geomorphologists, we often uh, simulate uplift just by having a block go up. Uh, and so what's, what's good enough? And, um, and that sort of gets back to this bigger question of where and at what scales couplings are achieved. Uh, and so um, more of this type of communication was, was absolutely um, one of the major uh, themes that came out. Any other group members that would want to chime in? Perfect time. Okay. 
It's still on? Okay. Scott and Jessica? Yeah, so um, I guess for the grand challenges, we sort of tried to distill them um, into, I guess, three we have here. And one um, has come up a lot already, and that's the disparate uh, length and time scales and what levels of complexity are important at different scales to capture the process level feedbacks and, and then how do these relate to one another. Um, the second was um, uncertainties, so how we quantify uncertainties in the models, especially as we start to couple different models and then compare them to data, how this happens. And then um, finally, one of the things that we thought uh, kind of is being worked on in, in both uh, surface models and um, tectonic models is trying to quantify um, both the controls on and the evolution of rock strength and rheology. Um, and this is a challenge for, for both um, uh, types of models and then can kind of be a bridge between the two. So this might be a fruitful area to try and bridge these two uh, fields. And yeah, a focus for the future. Yeah, and then to, to uh, meet the, or answer those questions or meet those challenges, we, we kind of have this general theme that we need uh, more efficient means to compare model outputs with geologic observables. And so as so we kind of saw two parallel databases or servers that, that, that we really just need to organize the, the data sets that are already in existence on both sides of the aisle. And so kind of a compilation and organization task to, to serve these data sets on, on some kind of global type platform so that we could see what observables there already are, be it geochemical data, uh, geologic data, um, and then have kind of an analogous database for, for, for model output um, so that you can more efficiently see what data exists and then also make that um, comparison between model outputs and observables. Um, and that, we thought that, would, that first step would let, let us see where we need new data um, and where we are quite data poor. Um, and then the, the, other, the other theme that seemed to emerge from the modeling part um, was our group felt that we have the pieces largely implemented that we could put them together and have a fully coupled model. Um, so let's do it. Um, and so, so in that discussion, it said, well, yeah, we, we have service processing models, we have geodynamic models, and, and we know how to make models talk. So let's, let's try it with what we have today. And that kind of started a general discussion of, of, yeah, the degree of, degree of <laughs> around this ground challenge of what is the degree of complexity? Can we do some parts cheaply, as Josh said? Can can we get away with just having a block uplift with a uniform uplift rate, um, or can you just diffuse away your topography? Um, so, so there was a discussion saying let's let's have make a fully coupled model, but think carefully about um, the complexity required there, um, and and the resolution needed. Um, and another theme was, to actually have this fully coupled model, there will be technical challenges that will likely require making more efficient parallel al algorithms um, so that we can solve bigger problems, um, as well um, as run more than one realization. So many of these maybe don't, um, types of models, the really only way forward is some kind of forward model. And so, so how could we actually get efficient enough so that we can have many realizations and do some kind of Monte Carlo type um, modeling to, to uh, quantify the sensitivity and uncertainty with those models. Anything else from group members? Perfect. Can we, sorry, I didn't, yeah, you guys come up. Great, thank you. Um, and then we'll have Stacia and Paula on deck, and last but not least will be Patricia and Allison. The later you go, the more repeat you get to do. Um, we also focused on spatial and temporal timescales and how to 
use both together or integrate different spatial and temporal time scales and about complexity. Um, and we thought about how complexity and different spatial and temporal time scales are used in models and also in the validation of those models with every uh, field evidence for, for these um, time scales being biased and limited by their own set of spatial and temporal constraints. Um, in terms of complexity, we, want, we talked about how, how we need modular uh, pieces of models that can be put together because there's too much for any one person to be a full expert in all of this stuff, but we also don't want black boxes. We don't want to have to trust a community without being able to also see the raw data and the assumptions that were used to make those modular pieces. And so for that, we talked a lot about um, sort of the meta process of how do you have a database that can capture what's out there at a very broad scale, but also sort of a parallel system to the way we write papers where we have the raw data available. We also, also capture the methods that were used and the results, and then we separate that out from the interpretations of these, both the data that we use to validate models and the modeling results themselves. So some sort of meta information around these models to capture this and make them reusable in the future and reinterpretable in the future. Yeah, so I, I think you know, other things that I have written down here <laughs> that weren't repeats. Um, uh, we, we spent a lot of time, like it sounds like a couple groups, uh, talking about sort of the needs for large data sets, but we also spent a while talking about the necessity of kind of easy ways of actually inputting standardized data in to sort of lower, basically lower the bar for entry into those data sets. Um, and so actually sort of working on good practices for database management and things like that. Um, and then we also came up a couple of times in various parts of the conversation about sort of the need for uh, having a wide range of sort of actual real world, real world examples of some of the processes we're studying. So trying to get away from fixation on very particular places that may be kind of end members, which are fun to study, but might not be telling us about underlying processes as much. Yeah, that balance between understanding one place really, really well, that high level of complexity, and then being able to simplify that in a smart way so that you can start generalizing to other places with less complexity or using less complexity. Stacia and Paula. Um, so you guys will see that our group said a lot of things that the previous group said already. So this is good because it means that we have an overall consensus that we can do. Um, and me and Stacia, we already, already organized this to sum up everything. Um, so I will just say the big questions, the big things that are describing everything that we talked um, in our group. Uh, so for the first questions, <laughs> Um, the first thing that we said was finding um, common goals. If we don't have common goals, it's kind of more difficult to do the linkage between the surface processes and the long-term tectonics. The other, the other thing that everyone already talked is the scales. So when you have different temporal and spatial scales, um, you cannot compare them and the type of data that you will need is different. So what sort of resolution would you need? How can you combine all of these um, different things, right? Um, feel free if I'm missing something, just to drop it in. Um, then another thing is, do we really understand each of the individual processes individually in isolation? If we are missing some of these individual processes, then how can we couple them? So 
it's more difficult. And let me scroll up. And are the processes that we are observing in nature transferable to other scales and to the models itself? Can we directly transfer things that we are observing? Can we, should we need to adjust something? Should we calibrate what we are seeing? Um, and then the type of scientific questions that we want to address, because that will condition overall the models that we want to implement. It controls the resolution and the scale that you want to use. For the second question, what are the data needs? Um, we believe that in order to define the data needs, we think that everyone should communicate a little more. So um, every different type of expertise should be included and they will share their opinion in order for everyone to understand what is the best type of data that we will need to acquire. Um, one thing is, for instance, the long-term data normally has lower resolution and the short-term data has a higher resolution. How can we combine them? Is it possible? How? Um, conduct more controlled natural experiments at certain sites and uh, evaluate the data. Um, the density of the data that we, what is the density of the data that we should use and the type of data needed to address each of the questions that we want to model. And then finally, we think that the data should be standardized and shared across disciplines. And the data needs to be shared in a format that can be used by everyone. And get the industry, industry on board in order for, her, for us to have more data as well. For the third one, what are the modeling needs? So we believe that we should have a facility to support and promote the community, the community growth and the community vision um, so that we can all have access to codes and not only have access to the codes and the models, but also learn how to run them. So it will be really useful to have guides and tutorials in order to model the codes. Um, one thing is, can I continue? It's almost done. One thing is that doing those guides and models um, is a lot of effort. So those should be recognizing that we have a DOI so that they can be uh, suitable. And another thing is that we believe in a combination of simple and complex models with both explain and benchmark models with geological data and bring the models outside. Um, bring all the community together for, for the model. Anyone from my group that wants to add anything? Thank you. All right. Well, at the risk of heckling from Jean Braun, I think glaciers have been missing from our discussion so far as a grand challenge. Um, but actually, in all seriousness, um, more broadly, quaternary climate variability, uh, we know that drives important time variability in climate and ecosystems and base level. And I'd say, I think it's a challenge that these climate factors may overprint tectonic things anytime that we're thinking about going past the Holocene. I think that's a real true challenge. Um, so we talked about using data to constrain or ground truth models is a challenge in itself. And facing this probably requires some better communication between modelers and data people. Um, we talked about trying to figure out what data types or sampling strategies provide best constraints and allow for discrimination between alternative hypotheses, uh, both on tectonic and surface process sides. Uh, when and where are there true feedbacks between tectonics and surface processes? Um, the spatial and temporal scales vary a lot and how can we span them, especially if we have different processes acting at different characteristic scales. Uh, related to that, to what extent is an event-based stochastic approach necessary and when can we assume more continuous processes? So storm events, we also heard about uh, earthquake cycles maybe, and then maybe glacial cycles can just be stochastic events. Um, I don't know. Okay, on data, 
we needed better constraints on timing in particular of surface processes, tectonics, and climate. Uh, it would be ideal to have multiple independent records of landscape change. Uh, maybe we, we'd like sedimentary, we like sedimentary archives, um, maybe even nested within the landscape, ideally. Uh, high resolution 3D mapping of lithology and fracture density and um, let's see, heterogeneous, oh, oh, there was a point about we need to allow for consideration of heterogeneous um, stress states in the upper crust, uh, especially from the geode geodynamic side, um, paleotopography, paleoclimate, paleotectonics, all of these things would be things we'd like to know. And then thinking carefully about how we're going to do data assimilation or use big data or use machine learning to help us handle large data sets and keep intact the information they contain about uncertainty. Uh, and then for modeling, uh, we talked about um, difficulties in coupling um, because of scales, um, whether we need to consider two-way coupling or whether we can do one-way coupling, uh, the importance of efficiency in algorithms. Uh, so what can be parallelized and how, uh, and that efficient algorithms will allow us to use ensemble approaches and inversion techniques um, that, that give us better handle on uncertainty. Uh, we need flexibility uh, to allow maybe the same model or same components of the model to be used for different time and space scales. We need to allow for variability in model parameters in space and time. And what am I forgetting? Thanks, everyone. So if anyone has additional comments, then please get those to your group leaders. Um, and we are moving on.